So let's now look at the allotropes of sulfur. So for the allotropes of sulfur, we see that we have two main types of uh, sulfur allotropes. That is, we have the rhombic sulfur and then we have the monoclinic sulfur. But let's first of all define what is an allotrope. So for the allotrope, we say that an allotrope is the existence of a substance in the same state but in different forms. So like these allotropes of sulfur, all of them are sulfur, but we see that we have sulfur which is rhombic and then we have sulfur which is monoclinic. So they're in the same state of being sulfur, but now in different forms. Now that is an allotrope. So we see that we have two main forms of sulfur. That is, we have crystalline sulfur and then we also have the amorphous sulfur. So as you can look in this diagram, we have the crystalline sulfur, which mainly comprises of uh, the rhombic sulfur and the monoclinic sulfur. Apart from that, now we have the amorphous sulfur, which, uh, which mainly comprises of the plastic sulfur, the colloidal sulfur, and milk of sulfur. So remember, we have two main forms of sulfur. Two main forms, we have the crystalline sulfur comprising of now the rhombic and the monoclinic. And then we have the crystalline, uh, the amorphous sulfur rather, which comprises of plastic of sulfur, the colloidal sulfur, and the milk of sulfur. So let's look at the two main, uh, the two main allotropes of sulfur which is studied in high school. That is, that is the rhombic and the monoclinic sulfur. So these are the two main types or two main allotropes of sulfur that we are going to discuss in this session. So for the rhombic sulfur, as you can see, that is the diagram of the rhombic sulfur. And then the other diagram is the diagram of the monoclinic sulfur. So if we increase temperatures above 96 degrees Celsius, if we increase the rhombic sulfur's temperature above 96 degrees Celsius, we're going to get monoclinic sulfur. So if we decrease uh, the, te the temperatures of monoclinic sulfur below 96 degrees Celsius, we are going to get the rhombic sulfur. So this we are going to look at is, go is called the transition temperature. First of all, let's begin with the first allotrope now, which is now the rhombic sulfur. So for the rhombic sulfur, you see that it is also called octahedral or alpha sulfur. It is called octahedral because this sulfur contains eight edges or eight corners. So that is why it assumes a shape of the octahedral shape. Octa meaning eight. So its shape looks like having eight edges or eight corners. It can also be called the alpha sulfur as it assumes the Greek letter A and then sulfur. So this is mainly because when observed using a hand lens, it assumes an octahedral shape. So the octahedral shape mainly comes in when you look at it using a hand lens, you're going to see that it has the different eight corners uh, that it has. So this allotrope is mainly stable below 96 degrees Celsius. So below 96 degrees Celsius, the rhombic sulfur is going to be it's going to be stable so above this temperature we'll see that the rhombic sulfur is going to change to monoclinic sulfur and then these temperatures uh, uh, that whereby rhombic sulfur changes to monoclinic and monoclinic goes back to rhombic we are going to see that it is called the transition temperature so the rhombic sulfur assumes a yellow color and then it has a melting point of 113 degrees celsius as well as a density of 2.06 grams per centimeter cubed. So this is the diagram of the rhombic sulfur. And as you can look at the diagram from top to bottom, you are going to see that uh, it assumes the octahedral shape that you can see. It has eight, uh, the, eight, the eight corners. So apart from that, let's now look at the next, uh, the next allotrope of sulfur, which is monoclinic sulfur. So the first one, remember, is rhombic sulfur. The next one is monoclinic sulfur under the crystalline forms of sulfur. So the monoclinic sulfur, you see that this is also called the prismatic or the beta sulfur. So the beta sulfur, it assumes the Greek letter, letter B, and then sulfur. So this is also called prismatic or beta sulfur. As you can look uh, at the diagrams of the sulfur, we see that these are the diagrams. So the other diagram is that if you look at it using a hand lens, uh, so you are going to see that it contains that shape. So you see that the monoclinic sulfur is basically stable above 96 degrees Celsius. So below these temperatures, it changes to rhombic sulfur. It automatically changes to rhombic sulfur. So for the rhombic sulfur, remember that we say that if you increase temperatures above 96 de degrees Celsius of the rhombic sulfur, we are going to get the monoclinic sulfur. If you decrease the, the temperatures of monoclinic sulfur below 96 degrees Celsius, you are going to get the rhombic sulfur. So for the monoclinic sulfur, remember we have said that it is stable above 96 degrees Celsius. 
So below these temperatures, it changes to rhombic sulfur. So above 96 degrees Celsius, monoclinic sulfur is stable. Below 96 degrees Celsius, it is unstable since it is going to change from being monoclinic sulfur and being rhombic sulfur. So this temperature, so these temperatures, uh, like whereby the monoclinic sulfur changes to rhombic sulfur, this temperature is called the transition temperature. So the temperature whereby the rhombic sulfur changes to monoclinic sulfur or monoclinic sulfur will change back to rhombic sulfur. So that intermediate temperature, so that temperature is called transition temperature whereby one, uh, the first allotrope of sulfur can be able to change to the next allotrope of sulfur by varying the temperature. So you see that below 96 degrees Celsius, the rhombic sulfur is going to be formed. Above 96 degrees Celsius of the rhombic sulfur, the monoclinic sulfur is going to be formed. And this is what we are talking about in this diagram. So for the rhombic sulfur, if we increase the temperatures above 96 degrees Celsius, we're going to get monoclinic sulfur. For the monoclinic sulfur, if we decrease the temperatures below 96 degrees Celsius, we are going to get the rhombic sulfur. So that, this is what we are talking about, this temperature, whereby uh, uh, like we can come from the rhombic sulfur to monoclinic and monoclinic to rhombic, that intermediate temperature is called the transition temperature. So you see that the monoclinic sulfur appears as needle-shaped or, or hexagonal prism when observed using a hand lens. So for this diagram is what we are talking about. So if you observe the monoclinic sulfur using a hand lens, you'll realize that it looks needle-like shaped or having assumed a hexagonal prism shaped when observed using a hand lens. So the other characteristic of the monoclinic sulfur, we see that it has a density of 1.98 grams per centimeter cubed. Remember for the rhombic sulfur, we say that it has a density of 2.06 grams per centimeter cubed. Now for the density of monoclinic now, is 1.98 grams per centimeter cubed. As well, it has a melting point of 119 degrees Celsius. And also we see that these allotropes assumes an amber or an orange color. So that's the color it assumes, an amber or an orange color. So apart from that, let's now look at the differences now between monoclinic sulfur and the rhombic sulfur. So on this other side, uh, this first side, you are going to have monoclinic, then you are going to have the rhombic. So for the monoclinic sulfur, you see that it is prism shaped. So that is the shape of the monoclinic sulfur. Hexagonal prism shaped. Hexagon mean, uh, meaning six edges. So it's it assumes a hexagonal prism shaped, and for the rhombic sulfur, you see that it assumes an octahedral shape, a shape which has eight edges. So the other difference is that the monoclinic sulfur is stable above 96 degrees Celsius, while the rhombic sulfur is stable below 96 degrees Celsius. The other difference is that the melting point of the monoclinic is 119 degrees Celsius. The melting point of the rhombic sulfur is 113 degrees Celsius. That is uh, the other difference. And then finally, we look at the density. So the density of the, uh, of the monoclinic sulfur is 1.98 grams per centimeter cubed, while the density of the rhombic sulfur is 2.06 grams per centimeter cubed. So that is all about the rhombic sulfur and the monoclinic sulfur. So remember the transition temperature. This is the temperature whereby monoclinic sulfur which will change to rhombic sulfur or the rhombic sulfur is going to change back to the monoclinic sulfur. So that, that intermediate temperature is what is, uh, is what is referred to as the transitional or the transition temperature. So remember for sulfur, if you look at this diagram for sulfur, we have two main forms. We have the crystalline forms and then we also have the amorphous forms. So for the crystalline forms, remember we have spoken about the rhombic sulfur, and the monoclinic sulfur. Now let's look at now the amorphous forms of sulfur. So the amorphous forms, first of all, we have plastic of sulfur. So for the plastic sulfur, it's mainly obtained by pouring boiling sulfur into cold water. So if you take boiling sulfur, you pour it into cold water, you're going to get plastic sulfur. Like for example, in the frost process, that is plastic sulfur. So you see that this plastic sulfur uh, it is mainly composed of molecules that are long chains of sulfur atoms. So very long chains of sulfur atoms have joined together in order to form this one long chain of sulfur which is referred to as the plastic sulfur. So apart from that, let's look at the, the next amorphous uh, form of sulfur which is now the colloidal sulfur.
So for the colloidal sulfur, you'll see that basically it's obtained by reacting hydrogen sulfide and sulfurous acid. So if you react hydrogen sulfide together with sulfurous acid, you are going to you are going to obtain the colloidal sulfur. Yeah, you are going to obtain the colloidal sulfur, and then finally we have milk of sulfur. So now apart from that, let's now look at the physical properties of sulfur. So what are the physical properties of sulfur from the boiling point, the density, etc. So first of all, we see that the melting point of sulfur is 113 degrees Celsius and the boiling point is 444 degrees Celsius. So the other physical property is that it is soluble in organic solvents. Example, we have oil, we have petrol, we have benzene, etc. So it is soluble in organic solvent and insoluble in inorganic solvents. And that's why in first process we say that the superheated heated water was unable to dissolve the sulfur because sulfur was insoluble. So sulfur is not soluble in organic, in inorganic uh, solvents. Like for example, we have the water. Water is inorganic. So sulfur will not be able to dissolve in water because water is inorganic. But for organic solvents, the solvents that are not polar, uh, polarized, they don't have the positive and the negative. So sulfur is going is going to dissolve in the organic solvents. Example, you have benzene, oil, petrol, etc. So you'll also see that the other physical properties that sulfur is insoluble in water or insoluble in inorganic solvents. So the other one you see that sulfur is yellow powder. If you can also be able to remember the fire extinguisher. So if you have ever sprayed a fire extinguisher which contains sulfur, you're going to find out that there are yellow sulfur deposits on the ground. So that yellow powder is sulfur. So sulfur is a yellow powder. Sulfur is also tasteless and odorless. So it doesn't leave any odor. So and also it is tasteless. So if you observe sulfur using a hand lens, you see that it has very tiny crystals of uh, yeah, it has very, it forms very tiny crystals. So that is the other physical property. So it has very small, brittle crystals in the structure. And then finally, we see that sulfur has a density of 2.1 grams per centimeter cubed. So those are the physical properties of sulfur. And in addition to this, we'll say that when the yellow sulfur powder is heated, it melts at 113 degrees Celsius to form an amber liquid. So this amber liquid uh, basically means that it's a combination or it's a mixture intermediate between yellow and orange. So somewhat an orange-yellow liquid. So remember, if we heat the yellow powder of sulfur, we see that this yellow powder is going to form an amber liquid. So that is the um, maybe an experiment of heating sulfur. So if we heat the solid sulfur or the solid sulfur powder, we are going to get an amber, an amber liquid. So uh, like in addition to the molten sulfur, we see that this sulfur, now the molten sulfur, will have a very low viscosity, meaning that it can be able to flow. So after we have heated the sulfur, we'll see that it will have a low viscosity, meaning that the sulfur will be able to flow. Somewhat it will be able to flow. So you see that basically this liquid is made up of eight sulfur atoms forming a ring, as you can see in the diagram. So this liquid mainly comprises of sulfur atoms bonded uh, to form this ring that you can see. So this liquid is made up of eight sulfur atoms which are bonded to form uh, the ring that you can see. So if you continue heating the amber liquid, so the liquid slowly begins to darken. Now remember we have the yellow sulfur, uh, sulfur powder. We have heated the sulfur, then the sulfur has melted. After it has melted, it has formed an amber liquid which assumes an orange color. So if you continue heating the amber liquid, the liquid slowly begins to darken. So after that, we see that at elevated temperatures of about 160 to 170 degrees Celsius, so the darkened sulfur will slowly by slowly and gradually begin to turn reddish brown and it will now start becoming viscous. Viscous meaning that it will now, the ability for it to flow will slowly begin to decrease. So remember, again, at elevated temperatures of about 160 to 170 degrees Celsius, so the darkened sulfur, remember it was orange, if uh, we continued heating, so it will now begin to darken. It will begin to darken, forming somewhat a reddish, a reddish brown, somewhat of a solid. So, and then this somewhat of a solid, the reddish brown, we'll see that it will be highly viscous. Viscous meaning that the ability for it to flow will slowly begin to decrease. 
So apart from that, we see that uh, this highly viscous sulfur, uh, this high viscosity is mainly brought about by the bonds of the 8 sulfur chain having been broken down to form a long chain of a thousand other sulfur molecules. So this chain, the short chain, will be broken to form a very long chain of other sulfur molecules. So very many sulfur molecules are going, are going to join together to form that very long chain of sulfur molecules. Now this very long chain of sulfur molecules will now be highly viscous, meaning that the ability for it to be able to flow will slowly by slowly begin to decrease. It will begin to decrease as you continue heating, it will continue to decrease, meaning that the small chains of sulfur are being joined together to form a very long chain of sulfur. So as the chain becomes even larger, the viscosity of sulfur also increases. So making the liquid unable to flow completely. So the liquid is going to become like hard and stony. So as the chain becomes larger, the viscosity of the sulfur will also increase. As it increases, the movement of sulfur, the ability of the sulfur to be able to flow will greatly begin to decrease, as you can see in this diagram. So the ability of sulfur is going to be, it's going to be hindered. So the ability of the sulfur to flow, that's what I mean, is greatly going to be hindered. So if, if you, or rather, so if you continue heating the sulfur above now that 160 degrees Celsius, the liquid will darken further and the long chain will break to form very short chains since the liquid is nearing its boiling point. So the boiling point, remember that now this sulfur that has turned a very stony liquid will now, uh, the long chains will now slowly by slowly and gradually begin to start breaking. They'll begin to start breaking as sulfur will be nearing the boiling point. So this, this movement of chain then increases since the long chains will begin now to break gradually and then we'll start seeing some reddish brown vapor of sulfur uh, having been formed. So they'll, they'll, uh, the reddish brown sulfur will begin to melt gradually as the temperature is nearing the boiling point of sulfur which is 444 degrees celsius so this reddish brown vapor mainly consists of sulfur 8 and sulfur 2 atoms uh, housed inside it so that is what happens when sulfur is heated so the yellow sulfur remember so you say that the yellow sulfur if we eat the yellow sulfur powder it will change into an amber liquid so it will change into an amber liquid uh, like meaning that this liquid will start now. The liquid will be able to flow at first. It will be able to flow. So if you continue heating the liquid, so the liquid will slowly start to darken. It will slowly start to darken. And then it will form a very tough liquid. Somewhat like a porridge, synonymous like porridge. So as the reddish, or as you continue heating the sulfur, so it becomes darker. It forms a porridge-like mass. The porridge-like mass will be unable to flow. So as you continue heating, the viscosity of the liquid will continue to increase. So the viscosity of the liquid will continue to increase whereby the short chain sulfur are going to form a very long chain sulfur. So this very long chain sulfur will have a very high viscosity. So if you continue heating the sulfur above 160, uh, 160 degrees Celsius, as we will be nearing the boiling point uh, which is 444 degrees Celsius, you will realize that some reddish brown gas will start being formed. Now this reddish brown gas will be a composition of sulfur 8 and sulfur 2 molecules, implying that the long chains of sulfur will now be gradually being broken down, forming a reddish brown vapor of sulfur 8 and sulfur 2, or of sulfur 8 and sulfur 2 gas. So as this vapor cools, so as this vapor cools, it forms a yellow sublimate of sulfur. So as it cools, it forms a yellow sublimate of sulfur, whereby this yellow sublimate will now be referred to as flour of sulfur. So this vapor formed mainly consists of sulfur 8 rings. So the sulfur 2 rings are going to join together and then uh, collectively they are going to form sulfur 8 rings, whereby now this vapor as it cools, it will now be referred to as the flour of sulfur. So apart from that, let's now look at the chemical properties of sulfur, whereby we are going to begin with the reaction of sulfur with metals. So if sulfur reacts with metals, it forms metal sulfide and heat is also liberated. So this reaction between sulfur and metal is mainly exothermic. So when sulfur reacts with metal, this reaction is basically exothermic, meaning that it will produce, uh, it will produce somewhat some heat. So any reaction which produces heat is referred to as 
an exothermic reaction. As you can see, that is the formula of reacting sulfur with metal, whereby if you react sulfur plus a metal, you are going to get a metal sulfide plus heat. So these are the examples of sulfur reacting with metal beginning with zinc. So if zinc reacts with sulfur, you're going to get zinc sulfide, which is zinc blended. If copper reacts with sulfur, you're going to get copper sulfide. And then also take note, we are having also heat. If iron reacts with sulfur, we are going to get iron 2 sulfide plus heat. So the next chemical property, let's look at reaction with acid. So what happens when sulfur reacts with acids? So basically we see that sulfur does not react with dilute acids. So why is this so? So sulfur does not react with dilute acids because sulfur is unable to displace hydrogen from the acid. Why is this possible? It is possible because if you look at the reactivity series, you see that hydrogen is highly reactive. So hydrogen is more reactive than sulfur. So it, it will mean that sulfur is unable to displace the hydrogen from its compound or from the acid. Now, since sulfur is unable to displace hydrogen from uh, the acid, it will mean that sulfur cannot react with dilute acids. So even if you try to, it to react with dilute acid, it will be unable to react with dilute acid because it is unable to displace hydrogen from the acid. However, you see that sulfur reacts with oxidizing agent. So the oxidizing acids like sulfuric acid, uh, conch sulfuric acid, that is a nitric acid, oxidize sulfur to sulfur 4 oxide. So it doesn't react with dilute acid, but it reacts with oxidizing acid such as conch sulfuric acid and nitric acid to form sulfur 4 oxide. So as you can look at these examples, we see an example whereby sulfur, sulfur is reacting with uh, conch sulfuric acid and conch nitric acid. So if sulfur reacts with conch sulfuric acid, take note, uh, first of all, if it reacts with nitric acid, so we are going to get uh, what? Uh, we're going to get sulfuric acid plus nitrogen oxide plus water molecules. So if sulfur reacts with uh, conch sulfuric acid, we are going to get sulfur oxide plus water molecules. So that is what happens when sulfur reacts with acid. So remember, does not react with dilute acid, but it reacts with oxidizing acid to give sulfur for oxide. So apart from that, we have reaction with oxygen. So what happens when sulfur reacts with oxygen? So you see that sulfur reacts with oxygen to form sulfur for oxide gas. So as in this experiment, we'll see that when sulfur reacts with oxygen, excess oxygen, we're going to get sulfur for oxide. So apart from that, let's look at reaction with, uh, reaction with water, and then we'll see that sulfur reacts with water forming hydrogen sulfide and sulfur for oxide gas. And this is the reaction whereby sulfur reacts with, uh, sulfur reacts with water. So we're going to get hydrogen sulfide and sulfur for oxide gas. So apart from that, let's now look at the uses of sulfur. So how is sulfur useful? So how, how can we be able to use sulfur? So first of all, we see that sulfur is used in making dyes. So the different dyes, if you look at the ingredients, you're going to see that sulfur elements will be possible. Though uh, very minute, but you're going to notice that sulfur element is present. So sulfur is used uh, in making dyes. Also, you see that sulfur is used in making different bleaching agents as well as making of medicine. So apart from that, we also see that sulfur is also used to make germicides and the fungicides as well as the insecticides. So apart from that, we'll see that sulfur is also used in the vulcanization of rubber, which uh, mainly means it makes rubber to be tough. Like for example, for the motor vehicles, for the vehicles of the, the tires. So sulfur is used to make that rubber to be very tough and not to wear out easily. So apart from that, you see that sulfur is also used in making of the gunpowder and the matches. So that match and the gunpowder, sulfur is also used to make that as well as potassium. So lastly, we see that sulfur is used in the manufacture of sulfuric acid, which you're going also to look at this topic, how to manufacture sulfuric acid in contact process.